to ask you to turn with me this evening to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, and a phrase we find in verse 14. Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. We read there concerning Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened. And our subject this evening is the lost soul's heart opened by God. What a beautiful picture is set before us here in this verse of the way the Lord brings about the conversion of a sinner. A lost soul, and lost she was, despite her wealth. Apparently in Thyatira, her home city, there was a trade guild of those who dyed cloth. Doubtless, she was part of that guild. She came to Philippi because it was a colony, a colony where many retired Roman soldiers had established themselves, men of wealth. And so she doubtless did a rich trade in this cloth, this purple cloth, which was the color of kings and royalty and nobility. But despite her wealth, she was lost. And lost we are too, all of us. We are perishing, ruined by sin. And unless the Lord opens our heart, ain't intervenes in our life, then however great our successes and our wealth and our pleasures in life, we shall end it lost, perishing for all eternity. Well, conversion, which is what is described here, Christian conversion, it involves two great things. The first thing it involves is the preaching of the gospel, of salvation. Gospel means good news. The salvation of our lost and perishing souls through Jesus Christ. This is the great means that God has appointed for the conversion of sinners. Faith comes by hearing, said the Apostle Paul. Hearing by the word of God. The word of God preached by those whom he has called and sent to proclaim the terms and the manner whereby sinners can be saved through the person and work of Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is, friends, that we are found this evening under the preaching of the gospel. The gospel is a trumpet. It alerts us. It draws our attention. It calls us to heed the voice of warning that it sounds. The gospel is a message of hope. It's a message of joy and peace. And you and I, when we hear the gospel preached, have one of the greatest privileges an individual here upon earth can ever know. But preaching alone will not save us. There needs to be something more. And that is the other great thing that I want to speak about this evening. And that is the work of God in our heart. That's what Lydia had. She heard the preaching of Paul. But alongside that, she experienced the touch of God such that it could be said her heart was opened. In fact, the language here is emphatic. It means to open wide like a gate, such that the word that Paul preached could gain entrance. And this will be our focus this evening, the opening of the heart by the Lord. Even though here Lydia came under the preaching of the mighty apostle, who had been the instrument God had used to call many from idolatry and from ignorance and from wicked ways, yet without the opening of her heart by the Lord, through his spirit, she would never have heeded that which Paul declared. Something more is needed than simply the preached word. 
The heart must be opened. False religion is where ideas are imposed upon an individual from without. True religion is where the work of God goes on within. And the effect is seen without in the person's life. The Lord Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Dough containing yeast, which is hid in three measures of flour. And the whole was permeated by the influence of that yeast. And when the Lord opens the heart, then a great inward transformation takes place in our lives. All of us need that. It's vital to a genuine experience of God's grace and conversion. What is meant by the heart? Lydia's heart was opened. Of course, this does not mean the physical heart. I'm sure none of us understand it that way. The heart in the word of God means the seat of our thinking processes, where the decision making takes place. It is from the heart that our desires and our purpose in life is set. The heart is the seat of the affections. We love things. We desire things. We admire things. It is the heart. And our hearts are closed to the things of God until the Lord deals with us. Think of the mind. The human mind, on account of sin, has no appreciation of the things of God, the claims of God, the glories of heaven, holiness, purity, the law of God, even the gospel of salvation. Our minds are prejudiced against God by nature. There is that barricade. We may be willing to concede an outward conformity. We will acknowledge God in just a token way. But our heart is far from the Lord. We have no delight in him, no real love for him, no concern to please him, no anxiety that we are at war with him, condemned by him, and there is no peace between us and God. Our minds are disaffected, you could say. Then you can think of our affection or our desires. They're set on earthly things and earthly pleasures, on self and not on God. Think of your priorities this evening. Where are they fixed? When you go from this house of God, this place of worship, you begin the new week tomorrow morning. Will God figure in your thoughts, in your desires? Do you admire him? Do you desire his help? Uh, do you study his word because you are filled with a love towards him? Or will these things just be passed to one side? Your heart is closed to the Lord, if that is the case. God must work within. This was not Paul's work. It was Lydia's heart that needed a divine work wrought upon it. Every convert, you could say, every genuine Christian is a walking and living miracle of grace. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he healed people of blindness, of lameness, of other diseases, leprosy. And we would say of them that they were walking miracles. But in a far more profound sense, Every Christian is a walking miracle. The heart which no man could change, no man could open, is opened by the Spirit of God, and a great change is effected. We sung that hymn of John Newton's just now. Many of you will know that he was one of the most foul-mouthed, cursing sailors of his day and generation, 
And yet the Lord humbled him and opened his heart and he became a humble, earnest preacher of the gospel. No man could do that. But the Lord is able to do such a work. He may use some sometimes dramatic means in order to open our hearts. We see that later on in this same chapter where the Philippian jailer is brought to his knees as a result of an earthquake. John Newton himself was humbled in the midst of a violent Atlantic storm where it looked, humanly speaking, as if the boat would sink and all would be lost. But here, in the case of Lydia, the Lord opened her heart in a much more gradual and yet irresistible manner. And often the Lord does that. He opens our hearts, moving within until we sweetly comply with that call of the gospel that is preached in our hearing. Someone illustrated the opening of Lydia's heart, indeed the opening of the hearts of many who become true Christians, like the opening of the gates of a canal lock. Now, I hope most of us here, if not all of us here, we can visualize a canal, maybe the Grand Union Canal. And on that canal, there are locks designed to aid the barges so that they can navigate the inclines that come about as you go through the canal. And initially, when you approach the lock in that boat or barge, it may well be that the gates of the lock on the upstream side are shut. And the force of the water is against that lock and that gate. You cannot open it until you fill the lock with water. And when the lock is filled with water up to the same level as the upstream side as the canal, then the gates will open easily. And the illustration is like this. Naturally speaking, our hearts are like those gates of the, the canal lock with the water out of the lock. The force of the water against that canal lock, uh, those gates, means that the gates are, can no way be opened. The weight of all that water upstream pressing against them is like pride and unbelief and atheistic ideas a love of self, a love of pleasure and the things of this world. We have no, we cannot, oh, our hearts are closed to the Lord and all the message of his word. We are hardened against these things. Impenetrable. That's what our natural hearts are when the word of God is preached. But what do you do? in order to open those gates. There is a small paddle, as it's called, a little flap, perhaps low down in those lock gates, and you open the paddle. He may even be below the water line, and it lets the water flow into the lock. And gradually, the water in the lock rises until the lock is full. And when the lock is full, then the gates can be opened freely. So the Lord, like that little paddle gate, opens the heart of Lydia and many whom he calls to himself, gradually filling our souls with those things which will incline us to receive the Saviour. Let me give you some examples. He may move within so that we have an increasing sense of our sinfulness before God, our need of his pardoning love. He may trouble our conscience, a conscience perhaps that has been asleep, dormant for many years, but then the Lord opens the conscience like that paddle gate 
and we begin to see and notice sins in our lives and we sense the guilt of those sins before a real and holy God far more than ever we did before. There's an awareness, a growing awareness of eternal things. That this life is but a speck of time and before us is a never-ending eternity. And there are only two destinies. And we begin to sense that these things are weighty matters. The reality of our death. Sometimes the Lord may lay his hand upon us and strike us with some illness. And it's a mercy. We've perhaps lived in a carefree manner. And then suddenly we realize that our bodies are not perfect and that we are mortal. The Lord may take that disease from us after a time, but it leaves its mark. The lock of our hearts is beginning to fill with spiritual concern. There's an increasing appreciation of the person of Christ. We sense our sinfulness, and we realize that there is only one way that our guilt can be taken from us, and that is through the person of the Savior. We understand his work at Calvary, how he willingly entered this life, took upon himself our nature, and there at Calvary, having lived a life of perfect obedience to God on behalf of all his people, he laid down his life, taking upon himself all their guilt and sin. And we begin to be drawn to him, to appreciate him, even to long after him. We have an interest and a concern to know, has the Lord died for me? Will he receive me? There's a readiness, a growing readiness to forsake our old life. And sometimes an increasing distaste for the world we were once so attached to. The pleasures that once thrilled us no longer fulfill. They no longer satisfy. We begin to see through this world and its vain promises, its foolish propaganda. We realize that ultimately there is a deeper meaning and a deeper need that we have in life. And that is to know the Lord and to be found forgiven through him, walking with him experiencing his touch in our lives. Doubtless this was the case with Lydia here. The lock was beginning to fill. Lord, the Lord was working in her heart. We're told that she was a worshipper of God. She reverenced God. That was unusual for many in her society. Perhaps through her dealings in cloth, she had become acquainted with Jewish people who introduced her to the God of the Bible, the true creator God. And she began to see that the gods of the Greek and Roman world were uh, imaginary gods, that they had no claim upon her attention and loyalty. It may be that she was moved to prayer we see her gathered here with the women alongside the river. But there's a note of caution here. She was a worshipper of God, but she wasn't a saved person. It would be a tragedy if some amongst us here, you count yourselves worshippers of God. You're willing, glad to regularly be here. But a worshipper of God will not get you to heaven. It's a good thing to do. Doubtless, the Lord moved her to worship, but more needed to be done. Her heart must be opened. And more than that, her opened heart needed to hear the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. So we can see here, if you like, the levels are beginning to rise. Lydia's heart is being softened. 
And as Paul preaches the glorious gospel of free and full salvation by Jesus Christ through grace alone, the doors of her heart are flung open wide. She receives the message and then we read she attends to those things which were spoken by Paul. Well, we may ask, what did Paul preach? Because Luke, the writer of the Acts of the Apostles, doesn't tell us here. But Luke does. Because he has told us earlier in the Acts of the Apostles the kind of messages that the Apostle Paul preached. Go back to chapter 13. And we see what Paul preached in Antioch in Pisidia. Unto you is preached through this man, he said, the forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 17. We see there the apostle preaching in Athens. And so we have a very good idea of what the apostle would say when he preached here by the riverside at Philippi. He would have spoken of the need of our souls, guilty, undone, ruined by God. He would have spoken of the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come to this earth to take upon himself a human body, to live as a man, a perfect man. He would have spoken of the cross. He tells us in many of his letters that he preached the cross of Christ. Why? Because the cross, though it was foolishness to the Greek, it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the cross of Christ. The message of one, the substitute for the guilty sinner, that is the message of hope that Lydia heard. We sung in that third hymn. Thus, though a sinner, I am safe. He pleads before the throne his life and death. On my behalf, he calls my sins his own. Thus, though a sinner, I am safe, he says. What a wonderful thing. There's the message. Safety for our souls from all the condemnation of and guilt of our sin through Jesus Christ. That's what Lydia heard. She heard of his resurrection. How she could be sure that the work of Christ was a finished work an acceptable work because it had the confirmatory warrant of heaven upon it. God raised him from the dead. His work, his sacrifice accepted. Paul preached this. It was foolishness to many, but to Lydia it rung true. This is the message of the living God. She believed it. She attended to it. It was a message of peace of assurance, of treasure in heaven. So now the heart was full and the gates opened without resistance. Any form of pride, love of the world that was in Lydia's heart, any misgivings she had concerning the person of Christ were dispelled. And as Paul preached, her heart opened by the Lord, she yielded. And she attended to those things. The former things have lost their power. Is your heart so touched by Christ this evening? Has the Lord been at work such that now you can say that, well, before there was great pride in my heart against the Lord. I was determined to have my own way. I questioned the claims of God. I questioned the ways of God. Certain things that happened in life, they seemed to me so unfair, and I was filled with bitterness and resentment. But now the Lord has been at work, and my heart has been filled with a sense of my own smallness, my own need, my own sin and brokenness before God. I can see, and I sense now something of the glory of Christ the saviour of sinners. I desire him as my saviour. And as you hear the gospel, is your heart 
being opened by the Lord such that you say, I long after him. I would have him as my Lord and as my Savior. I want to know the comfort that he has received me, readily forgiving me for his sake. He's the only one who can deal with my lost and needy condition. Well, she attended to those things that were spoken by Paul. These are intense words. She attended. Earlier in the verse, we read, she heard. That means she listened intently. She carefully noted everything that the apostle declared. Her heart was opened wide like the gates of that lock to receive the truth that she heard. And then she attended to it. The word means to give careful heed to something. And if the Lord opens our hearts, this will be the consequence, the result. So as we draw to a conclusion, let me ask this question. First of all, has the Lord opened your heart? Can you say now that your heart is full of spiritual concern, of a deep desire for Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know your need? Do you desire him in such a way that when the gospel of Christ is preached, your desires are drawn to him and you would yield to him so freely? Is your heart filled with conviction, with an awareness of your sin? Then follow the example of Lydia here. She attended to those things that were spoken by Paul. What does that mean? Well, we see the results in her life. But of course, they were the outward fruits of an inward response. She was baptized. Baptism is a public profession of a person's faith and confidence in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. That was the outward evidence, but it bore witness to an attention that she had already, a response, if you like, that she had already expressed within. When we are baptized, we are saying, I understand that Christ came and that he was buried and he rose again the third day. I understand that I must be united to him, that as a lost sinner, he must take my sin upon himself. I must receive his perfect obedience as my righteousness. And so in baptism, we are identifying with Christ in his death and his resurrection. We are by faith being bound to him. That's the attention. Lydia here, before Paul baptized her, must have professed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he came, that he lived a perfect life, that he died and rose again on behalf of sinners like me, and I rest in him. I yield my heart to him. I publicly declare that he is all my trust. I abandon all previous creeds. I abandon all the gods of my forefathers. I abandon all those superstitions that are rife in the Roman world, and I own Christ as the Lord of glory, the Savior of sinners. Is your heart been so opened that you're willing to rest in Christ and yield your whole life to him? That's the first thing. But not only was she baptized, she then sought to constrain the apostles. Look at the end of the following verse, verse 15. She said, if you have judged me, to be faithful to the Lord. Faithful here in the sense, if you, be, if you judge me to be a genuine believer, that I've believed, that I'm now wholly bound to the Lord Jesus Christ, then she said, come into my house. You see, she not only believed, but she was now willing to own him as her Lord. 
she was ready to serve him with her life. And the only way she could show her love and gratitude in service was by serving the Lord's sent servants. That was her expression of love to the Savior. She attended to those things that were spoken by the Apostle Paul. Have you? Have I? Have we yielded to the Savior, trusted our souls to him? Are we now ready to serve him, to be of use within his kingdom, to, to walk in his ways? All that she had, she placed at the disposal of the Apostle Paul, this man of God. It was her way of saying, from now on all that I am, I devote to the Lord who has lived and died for me and revealed himself to me through the Apostle Paul's preaching and who has opened my heart to receive this precious gospel message. May the Lord open our hearts and move us to yield to the Saviour this evening. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank thee for these two great works that were experienced in the life of Lydia. First, the opening of her heart, but secondly, the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Grant that we too may be made real Christians. Open our hearts. Remove all those things that weigh down and oppose the entrance of thy truth. Fill our hearts with spiritual concern. Help us to understand the value of Christ and then open those gates of our heart that we may receive him and yield to him and trust him with our souls and experience his salvation. We ask these things for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is 390.